Okay, as I said previously, we hope to finish the first post part of the course this week. So we can kind of move on into the, should you say, more direct event part next week. And we're kind of halfway into the planned course time, so this seems like a kind of reasonable objective to achieve. So uh, I think we should be able to finish in time. Um, we are talking about the exercise for today, which is exercise two, and it's on aggregate production planning. Uh, and the idea is to kind of look, uh, use this lingo tool to try to analyze what's happening when you change some of the parameters or the costs of the problem. At least that was the idea from my point of view when I kind of made this exercise. It seems to have been made in 2010, by the way, so it's it's a few years ago. So Jonas, did you try this? Uh, to do the exercise. Yeah. You looked at it. Oh, did you manage to do it? Okay, very nice. What about you, Oliver? Did you try? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This will be on the tape, you know. <laughs> These other three, they are lucky. They kind of they uh, they stated that they looked very carefully at the exercise before we started taping, but they had some small problems as uh, we moved along. Okay. Yeah, and these uh, three different solutions, this uh, optimal solution, number one, and these non-optimal solutions, number two and three, were discussed in the lecture. So let's move on here and see what it says. Uh, <coughs> the first one says, describe eventual structural differences between these three solutions and try to explain your observations intuitively. So the meaning of that question is that you can, should kind of look at these three different solutions all three are kind of discussed in the textbook and try to kind of look at structural differences. And then of course you need to know what I mean by structural differences, which is perhaps not very clear from the text here. So uh, I could explain it to you now. A structural differences is kind of how the solution behaves. Do you have a solution where you use a lot of inventory? That's one structure. Where you use little inventory, that's another structure. And of course, what we expect to see here intuitively is that in situation two, where you actually impose a chase demand or a zero inventory strategy, there you should have zero inventory. And you would expect in order to achieve this zero inventory, if the demand is kind of changing a lot, you will have to meet your demand by hiring and firing a lot. So we would expect a lot of hiring and firing in that kind of solution. And we, we looked at that example and we saw that. Didn't we? we saw that you kind of had to build up with more people and you fire and you build up again to kind of hit these changing demand patterns. Opposite, you would expect in situation three here that uh, if you really impose a constant workforce solution, of course you should get that. So then you kind of hire up the necessary minimal amount of people at the start and you keep that all the way through your planning period. And that's exactly what you get. And finally, a solution by linear programming should typically be somewhere in between here, where you kind of balance these two forces. So you end up with doing a little bit less hiring and firing than the zero inventory solution, and sp using a little bit less inventory than in this other case. And the idea then, of course, is that when you mix this, you kind of tune the total costs in a way that you are able to come up with smaller total costs than in this two other cases in which we also saw demonstrated in the lectures. So, so, so this is kind of the answer I would expect you to write on part question A. Straightforward. Really not problematic at all. Assume now, now we are here. Hello, Maria. No, sorry. That's okay. You don't throw people out here. Assume now that we want to judge. I'm, I'm seeing bad and I'm hearing bad. This is not good. Assume now that we want to judge the effect of changing various costs. The example model contains three cost elements CH, CF, and CI. CH is the 
hiring cost, CF is the firing cost, and CI is the inventory cost. Suppose we want to investigate the effect of having each of these cost elements very large compared to the others. That is, the following three cases are to be analyzed. The first case, case one here, or small i, CH is very large, and these other two are very small. In case two, CF is very large, these other two are very small, and finally this final case where the inventory is very large uh, in cost, while the hiring and firing costs are small. And then again, it comes a question here which kind of tries to force you to think about reality in a sense. Uh, what kind of situations could we expect to be covered by these three cases? Perhaps not a very easy question. Let us look at the, the solution. Exercise 2, we have to go up a level here. Go here. No, not here. Sorry. Solution. So let's look at B. Maybe we can blow it up a little. Let's try. That doesn't work. <coughs> Mag. Marquee Zoom. Maybe that's good. Yeah, that blew, blew it up a little bit at least. Situation small i described by very large hiring costs as opposed to the other two cost elements could for instance be a situation with extreme economic growth paired with poorness. You know countries who are kind of in a very strong change period where you kind of are able to develop uh, the economic situation you, you could perhaps expect that these countries are, should we say, moving into richness. And in that situation, you would expect at least in, in some time that these hiring costs could increase. Because when you grow, you may run into problems with the labor market. Okay, it's as you move along, of course not in the start, but when you kind of keep on growing, you, you, you could expect that uh, getting enough and right quality people could become difficult, at least after some time. But uh, normally these countries, if they started out poor, would typically have a very limited uh, uh, labor union system. So you could still expect that they could be cheap to fire. Okay? So in this transition period, as of course, if you move far enough in the future, the country is developed. And in that case, you will be, however, have both high hiring and firing costs high. But before you kind of end at that point, you, you could expect that uh, the hiring costs are those who first kind of start to grow. And uh, the inventory cost is typically coupled to a situation where you kind of produce very valuable products. And that is perhaps not what you expect to find in a developing country, at least not in the start. Even though we see changes on that these days. You see a lot of computers produced in rel relatively low cost countries, by the for, to take an example, so, so, you, so you could have situations where you have a high, high hiring cost as well as a high inventory cost, but a low firing cost. But uh, I say here, uh, a poor country would probably not produce products of high value, leading to relatively small inventory costs at the same time in an un undeveloped country. Firing costs may also be pretty small, not too much unions and work laws. <coughs> and finally, extreme economic growth may put high pressure on the labor market, yielding very high hiring costs. The situation in China may perhaps fit this kind of description. I hope I don't off offend you now, Olivia. You're Chinese, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. But China is, is, in many instances, perhaps a very typical example of this situation. Okay, we have a very strong economic growth over many years. And of course, today, China is kind of like any developed country. The, the prices on, on flats are extremely high, maybe 10 times even here. So. So at least in Shanghai, I think. Have you been to Shanghai? No. Has anybody else been to Shanghai? No. It's, a, it's quite a city. I haven't been there, but I have, I've seen some. I have talked to people who have been there. They have this new railroad system, which is phenomenal, I think. It's, uh, yeah. I, OK. We are kind of moving ahead here. So let's move to the next uh, paragraph here. Situation double, small i, described by very large 
firing costs compared to the other elements may seem typical in, for instance, Norway. This is a kind of typical Norwegian situation. Of course, you have high hiring costs in Norway, but the firing costs are kind of extreme. It's almost impossible to fire people due to the very strong structure. At least people which are kind of working in my position as kind of a public uh, servant, then it's almost impossible. So you, you, sh you should expect at least a year with all kind of negotiations with unions and lawyers and trials and a lot of stuff. So it firing a person could uh, easily amount to several million Norwegian crowns. So uh, this situation is typical for perhaps developed countries who are kind of going down, on, the, on their way down, so to speak, like Norway and the United States and all these countries, you know, which kind of ha probably have reached the peak many years ago. Okay, and then finally, side situation, triple small i, with very high inventory costs, would typically be markets with very high valued products. As we said, typically inventory costs are a kind of fraction of the value of the product due to the fact that you cannot, you cannot miss the reinvestment opportunity by kind of binding your capital into, into the product itself. And of course, all kind of stuff which, which has high values. What does it say here? Airplanes, rockets. Of course, you don't store many airplanes, do you? Uh, typically, in these situations, you, you do what we refer to as make to order or using a chase demand strategy. So you kind of get the order and then you make the plane. You don't make the plane unless you have the order. So airplane is perhaps not an, a good example here. But of course, we, we know that many high-valued produ products, like the one uh, Jonas is using on his desk, for instance, quite a high-valued product, is stored. Apple do not make everything to order. They pre-produce a lot of computers and then they ship, they to ship them to the market and wait for the customers to, to buy them. <coughs> it says further here, also product markets with very high needs for uh, expensive handling. We said that in most cases, inventory costs are typically related to the value of the products, but it could be special products you have very high handling costs, you know, like nuclear material, for instance, where you need a very high security level. Uh, again, of course, it, it's uh, speculative to assume that it's actually being stored, but uh, we know that the security needs are very high. So, and of course, uh, high security needs is typically high costs. So all kind of products which kind of need special handling, uh, special taken care of, high security will cost a lot on the inventory side. So it's kind of this combination with either extreme handling costs or either extreme value or both of course would uh, lead to a situation where you have kind of higher inventory costs than the other costs you compare with. Of course all kind of possibilities can be combi combined here if you like to, to look at uh, try to find situations where, where you can find these this, this. Diamonds, of course, is a classical example, very high-valued products, which are stored in some cases. I don't know if you have any diamond mines in Zambia, Joe, do you have? No. No, that's basically in the southern Africa, Africa in South Africa, and South Africa, Zimbabwe, yeah. perhaps? Zimbabwe. Yeah. Sure. What did you say, Zimbabwe? How do you pronounce Zimbabwe? Zimbabwe. Z okay, I'm, I was not so bad after all. Okay. Okay, any questions to A and B? Of course, this B question is perhaps not so easy. You, you have to think a little bit and be slightly creative to kind of come up with this. So, and of course, that was the idea here, to, to test your creativity here at some point. It's not obvious that, that the, the kind of geographic language is the right one here, okay? Uh, it could be like that, but it could, of course, be other, other ways to do it. Okay. Let's go back to the text here. Um, now we have finished A and B and we are at C. Can this be read it? If no, it. Use lingo and simulate the situations one, two, three and discuss your actual results. Do they seem reasonable? And of course, we, we know what the results should be like. So, and of course, they will be reasonable. So this is really not uh, a big task. 
The question here is really only related to using lingo and trying to do it, to make it work. And uh, in principle, it should be fairly easy because you have a starting point here, don't you? If you go up a level here and into this one, I think it was a model here. This one. Uh, save us. Let me let you save it on the desktop and have a look at it. And of course, you need the software to kind of make these run. You may you need the software to run on your computer. If you don't, then of course it's impossible. So let's have a look at it. Can we open it in uh, Lingo, perhaps? No, that will not work. No. Oh, almost. Almost correct. I think we do it again. Yeah, there it is. Uh, basically, what I'm asking you to do is just to change the numbers here. So you, you just go in here, and if you want to have a high hiring cost, you change this number here to a high number. Okay. If you put uh, three zeros more here, you can put uh, three zeros more here. Moving from 500 to 500,000, that would be a simple way of doing it. And of course, if you do that, you get a solution where you tend not to hire people. And if you tend not to hire people, then you typically will tend not to fire people as well. Do you see the point? Because these, kind of, these two costs are related, in a sense. Of course, if you have zero firing cost, then you can fire, but then you would have to hire again at a later point, which would cost a lot. So typically, this, uh, this situation would, would imply not only a high hiring cost, but also a high firing cost. And the other way around, if you increase the firing cost, then you would not hire. So you kind of have basically these two situations structured here. And then it's just running Lingo and look at the solution. And you, you see exactly what the, what the textbook shows. But of course, in the textbook, you didn't do this exercise. You kind of started with kind of logically arguing for how these two solutions kind of came up. But here we actually use a model to, to, to simulate this kind of situation. And the idea was very simple, just to increase the numbers on each of these three cost elements. OK, you do not want to save this one. And what happened to my, ah, it's still here. How oh, nice. Mm -mm -mm. Maybe it's here, yeah. yeah. Let's look at the. Uh, at uh, the solution here. If we look at situations one and two with either high hiring or firing costs, obvious, obviously we would try to minimize hiring and firing, leading to a solution structurally close to the constant workforce solution. We kind of keep everything fixed. Alternatively, a situation with high inventory costs would lead to a situation close to the no inventory solution. Which is kind of obvious, isn't it? If the inventory cost is very high, you try to avoid having inventory. So you try to kind of stick to a zero inventory solution. Hence, it should be possible to simulate LPs where the optimal solution structurally resembles these two endpoint city solutions. And that's kind of what you're asked to do here, to kind of just change the numbers, look at the optimal solution, and see that you identify these two, two kind of extreme point type of solutions. So then to simulate situations one or two is su sufficient to just change the costs of hiring or firing to extreme values. For instance, changing CH from 500 to 5 millions, I even put an extra zero on here, is the solution as shown by the figure below. So here we have very high hiring costs and of course we, ec we, we get the kind of solution we expect here. It may be hard to see here, but if you look at the hiring here, you kind of start by hiring up, take one hiring, but then you do no hiring, of course. No firing either, which kind of is a, a, a consequence of this. So this is what you expect to happen, and this is what, what happens. And then it's just kind of writing that, okay? This is what you expected, and it turns out to be, be the case. <coughs> so our model seems to be right in that sense, okay? This is one way of testing these models to see if they behave as we expect them to do. As the figure indicates, H1 close to 1, 1, 1, which was the kind of number we came up with when we analyzed this without using these tools in, in the textbook, uh, the constant workforce solution is indeed the outcome. Obviously, as there is no firing in this solution as well, extreme firing costs would also like be kind of equal to this situation. So you get the same kind of thing in those two situations. There may, of course, be other possibilities. 
other possibilities, other possible solutions with no firing at all. If we move to uh, looking at uh, these uh, inventory costs, I have changed that from 80 to 8 million, an extremely big inventory costs. Uh, and of course, then you get the solution you expect, where uh, the I variable is uh, zero, zero <coughs> for one, including five. So, of course, you get what you expect here, no inventory, if the inventory cost is, is very high. Okay. Back to the text. Assume now that the storage space is limited to storing 500 units in any period. Does this information change the LP solution? And of course, then, what this means here is that you, you cannot really store more than 500 units in, in, in a single period. And of course, if the optimal solution states that any value of these i is larger than 500, then that's not allowed. But if the optimal solution do not do that, then it's okay. Nothing changes. And in this case, that's what's happening. Uh, all optimal inventory variables in the original optimal solution with, with a given cost, not with these change costs, are below 500. So there is no need to do anything than just stating that, that uh, the optimal solution have no inventory variables with an inventory volume larger than 500. And as such, these new constraints doesn't change anything. But indeed something then happens. Assume now that the storage space is limited to storing, no, sorry, E. Assume finally that the storage space, storage capacity is 100 units at the maximum, and that you're given the option of increasing it to 500 units. How much would you maximally pay for this option? And of course the idea here is that now something changes. So you change the solution from the starting solution to another solution, and one thing which is kind of obvious, but many students do not think about it, is that if, if, if you have a problem and you put more constraints on it, the only thing that can happen is that the solution gets worse. The more constraints you put on an optimal, pro uh, optimal uh, model, uh, of course, uh, either nothing happens, like in this first case, or something happens. And if something happens, then you have less to choose from, and then you cannot accept to, to get the same value on your objective function. So typically putting more constraint into an optimization problem would produce worse values. This is kind of easy to understand, isn't it? If we, if we have an unconstrained optimization problem, we want to maximize, we can get the value up here. If we say that x must be smaller than 5, of course this is our new optimal solution and it's worse than, lower than the original one. On the other hand, if we put a constraint here on 10, and say that x should be smaller than 10, then nothing happens because this value is within the boundaries. This is kind of the first situation where, where the constraint was 500. This is kind of the second situation where the constraint was 100. So uh, in that sense, it should be kind of easy to answer this fun question because then we solve the problem without constraints, then we solve it with a new constraint. Of course, we have to add these new constraints. We must say that I1 must be smaller than or equal than 100, the same with i2. And we have to put this on all five i's, and these must be entered into our lingo model as new equations. And then we solve again, then we get another solution. So we have we have without constraints. Then we get one optimal value, okay? And then we add these constraints, we get another one. And the, the point is that we would, should expect here that this set one star should be larger than set zero star, because here we are minimizing costs, okay? So this is a, a worse solution. And the difference between these two objectives should reflect the amount we're willing to pay in order to expand our capacity back from this situation into the no constraint situation, okay? So then the answer is just taking set one star and subtract set O star. That produces the answer on 
question E. Okay, let's look at what it actually means here in numbers. You, you can see here, if you can see it, no, you can't see it. Uh, we start here with the original solution, and you see here now that we have an I5 here on 378, which of course is larger than 100, so that doesn't work. And we have a one here, 340, and this is 160. So there, there are actually three instances of the inventory which kind of breaks our new constraint of smaller than or equal to 100. Of course, then we have to add that into the model. And if you look at this figure, you see that I have done exactly that. I keep my model and then I just add these five new constraints at the bottom here and I solve again. And then uh, it turns out, as it says in the bottom here, adding the new constraints, one has structural as well as value consequences, adding new effective. We tend to use the word effective on constraints that actually work. <laughs> this is, of course, the reason why, everybody, why nobody wants to lower the CO2 emission, of course, because doing that is kind of putting constraints on a lot of object, uh, opt optimization problems, and that would cost something. So that's kind of how you can compute the cost of adding an efficient deal on reducing CO2, CO2 emission. Okay. You can kind of solve the worst optimization problem with it and without it, and you can take the difference to kind of find the the actual cost in money, if you like. Uh, that is, uh, the total logistics costs increase. In this case, the two helpers have solutions. The original one is 331,320.9, and the uh, width constraint solution uh, increases, as we said, to 432,601.2. Uh, Obviously, the maximum amount of money one should be willing to pay for uh, increased storage capacity should then be the difference between these numbers, which amounts to be 101,280.3. And of course, if you are offered to increase your capacity at a, a monetary amount below these numbers, then it would be profit profitable to, to do this, wouldn't it? Because you are able to reduce your costs by almost almost a third, no, not that much, at least 20-25 percent. And if the cost of, kind of making this capacity increase is not so big, then you you should do it, given that you are greed, greedy, of course. So here you see a, a very typical way of using this optimization technique in practice to kind of try to look at different situations, solve different optimizations and problems, and compare them and look at the effect. Okay, that ends exercise two. Do we have any questions? Not so many, but as I said, you need to spend some time on this lingo tool. We will, we will continue using it all through the course, and you must expect to be tested on your knowledge about this tool on the exam. We started briefly discussing, before everybody came, on what kind of exam we should have. There are two options, either an open book exam or a closed book exam. Um, I suggest that we use an open book exam in this course. That, of course, as you may be aware of, moving from a closed to an open may have some impact on the difficulty of the exercise, but I, 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 I believe really that uh, this change in difference uh, difficulty is not so big really here. Uh, of course, I decide that anyway, so, <laughs> <laughs> so that's that, that uh, you, you, you could really r rely on me. So I, I really suggest we we, we use an open book. And the main reason, of course, is that all this stuff about this lingo th kind of thing is hard to yeah. keep in your head, okay? So you, you can kind of bring some notes and to uh, instead of uh, learning it by heart. I think that's a better resource usage in this course. So do we agree on this? Yes. I think we are kind of uh, in a position where we can make a decision here if we look at the number of students comp and compare it to the number of, of uh, the total number of students. So uh, I hear no... Uh, okay, then we make a decision. Let's write it down. Uh, 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 
what happened? <clears throat> Suddenly there's only two images here. Why is that? What happened to what happened to the frontal part? There is no option of going back there. No option of going back there. I must have killed it. I, there is no other way to... I have to enter it again then. Sorry about this. As I said, I don't like Windows 7. So, let's go to our room. And write a new message here. We we have made collective decision on going for an open book exam period. Yes. Erika, you talk with Tina? Yes. Yeah, so you can kind of tell her, and if she's very angry, she must come here and we may have a discussion, okay? Maybe I should put my initials here, just to, even though it doesn't. Today is the 16th, isn't it? And it's September, which is month number nine. And the year is 213. Okay. Okay. Then let's look a, a bit a little bit more on the topics I planned for this week. Um ba, 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 16th, that's today, yes. Yeah. Exercise 2, uh, we have done that, and uh, some discussion on exercise 3, we can do that, the final part of this hour, and then we move into. Uh, the rest here, which is related to basically uncertainty and uh, so-called newsboy problem. So we need to spend a little time on looking at some concepts which may or may not be very strong in your mathematical mind. But we will try to do it in a simple and uh, understandable manner, hopefully, we will see. So, exercise three, a few words on that one. Yeah, as you probably remember, we were dealing with these lot size problems last week, and of course this exercise is related to that. Uh, here we have a producer with, uh, which produces a single product and faces a given forecasted demand for the next 10 weeks. If you look at these demand, you probably recognize the numbers. They are kind of the same as the example, but they are they kind of being changed in time here. So, uh, so you cannot use the example in the textbook directly here. You have to actually do this to find the correct answer, even though the numbers are the same. Uh, so the idea then here to start with is to, to actually use lingo. You already have a model. You just have to change the demand data so that they're kind of uh, structured correctly, and then you run it, and then you get the solution. The set of costs and over 132 and the inventory cost of 0 0.6 are the same as in the example. And then you're asked to use the silver mill heuristic. Of course, you have to do it on paper. Unless you want to program it on a computer, that's up to you, of course. Uh, and you should kind of compare these two solutions. You would expect, of course, that the solution in A is better than the solution in B, because the solution in A guarantees an optimal solution, while the silver and mill heuristic does not guarantee it. So in most cases, you would get differences here. So in, uh, the idea then, I don't know what happened. I don't remember, actually, whether it, it could, have, of course, produce the same solution, but I don't think it does. And then we introduce some production capacity again. We say that uh, there is some limitations here on what is allowed and not. Uh, much in the same manner as in the previous exercise. Of course, then you have to expand your model, change it a little bit, perhaps uh, something close to that. It seems uh, reasonable. And then there's the question, what would happen if the maximal production amount is smaller than 43.9 units? This 43.9 is probably a magical number. I won't, 
I will leave it to you to look into it. It has something to do with, uh, if you remember, we kind of, if you add together all the demands, there was something 439, wasn't it, on the total demand? 43.9 seems to be the average demand. Maybe that has something to do with it. If you go under that, then you may run into problems, actually. Yeah, you can try it, of course. It's, it's just a test. Of course, uh, something will happen on your Lingo software if you do this. That's the idea, okay? And now we move to something slightly more difficult. Suppose now that the producer produces more than one product. So s now we're moving to a different situation, to a more, should we say, real world like situation where there is more than one product being produced. But uh, in E, there is a kind of special situation uh, which uh, includes a so called unlimited production capacity. So there are kind of nothing constraining the production. Here you can produce as much as you like. And uh, I ask you to discuss how uh, this producer can solve his extended lot size problems in that situation. The answer is very easy. The question is whether you find it, okay? Then on F, even more difficult, now we actually have a kind of binding constraint on, on, uh, on production capacity. And of course then, in order to be able to solve this, you need to give meaning to what limited production capacity could be in this kind of problem. And I will help you a little bit here, I think, to, to kind of put you in the right direction. When we were talking about lot size, we had this xt, hadn't we? Which was the production amount in each time period. What we're doing now is that we're introducing more than one product. So typically we would say now we can have something like this, xit, which is the produced amount of product i in time period t. Okay. If we have limited production capacity in this period, we would say that a certain x, say x3, should be smaller than or equal to something, okay, 100 or 50 or whatever. Okay. But when we move into a multi-product situation, we have to kind of give meaning to what limited production capacity could be. It could be that we have different machines for different products. In that case, it would be like that. But in most practical cases, we have a kind of common machine facility. So if I produce more of one product, then I have to produce less of another one, given that it's constrained. And then you could say something perhaps that if we add together all our products in a given period, maybe multiply with some kind of constant here, a i t, which says how much of these resources we spend when they produce product i in period t, then these kind of things should perhaps be constrained by some kind of upper or lower bound on, on stuff, typically an upper bound, so that we kind of can produce over something. If you think about an event, you will typically have this, don't you? If you want to serve drinks, okay, and you have a limited set of bartenders, if these bartenders suddenly are serving a lot of uh, what drinks could they serve? Uh, rum and coca-cola of course then they would have to serve less gin tonic okay that is how you kind of could describe this kind of situation of course you have to kind of change the model now into a multi-product setting if you're serious about, as about this of course you can read and you'll find that a lot of people have done this already so you don't have to find it up yourself but that's up to you okay it's not very difficult really so that was a few words on exercise three and then we take a break.